Okay, welcome to Wireless Without Batteries, officially, uh, to both the Shenzhen students here and the uh, uh, distance learning students as well. I have a couple introductory slides. I think before I do that, though, I'm going to get rid of my SATCOM notes here. And I'll start just by going over the syllabus for the class. The, an electronic copy of the syllabus will be uploaded online on T-Square by the end of the day. I'm actually in the middle of reformatting them. Georgia Tech has this new template uh, that has come out for syllabi. And I'm having to redo all of my old ones so that they're fitting this template. <coughs> but I'll give you the, the the long and the short of it. This, of course, is ECE 8813, Wireless Without Batteries. It's actually a working title to capture the many different things that we'll study in the class. I'll name them off in a, in a bit, and you'll see them on the syllabus as well. It's sort of a catch-off for this emerging field of low-powered communications and computation. Um, how to build a sensor that doesn't have a battery, for example. How to build a system that uses RFID um, or tomography or uh, uh, this whole idea that, that of the Internet of Things, where you can have a bunch of devices that connect things to the Internet. Of course, if those devices required a battery or had something that, at least a battery that you had to change out every couple weeks, First of all, you'd create an ecological catastrophe because you'd be sending hundreds of millions of pounds of batteries to the landfill every year. And secondly, that, that's labor intensive. Um, in the field of RFID, where I do, I've done a lot of work in this particular area, you know, the tags that we put on inventory devices and things like that are now down to maybe a couple cents a piece. And if you had to put even the smallest, tiniest battery on them, they would cost a dollar. So you lose two orders of magnitude in the cost of something if you have to put a battery onto it, let alone the labor that you have to do to cha change the battery and maintain it and all this stuff. So that automatically excludes an uncountable number of applications. And what I'm going to show you in my introductory slides is that this the world of technology is suddenly enabling these applications where you don't need the battery anymore. You can do computation, you can do communications, you can do radio communications over great distances in some instances without a battery. Or with some energy harvesting and a tiny battery that lasts five years in the field. But that, that's really going to be the two questions that we'll delve, delve into a little bit later. We're going to answer things like, fundamental questions like, what is the minimum of, amount of power that you need to do communications. That's sort of the energy harvesting problem. And another question we'll have is, what is the minimum amount of power that you can pull out of the air, that you can transmit wirelessly? Because wi wireless power is small. There's a lot of it around, but it's small in terms of absolute magnitude in both voltage and power. But we're getting to the point where we can actually do some really neat things with even that small amount, which I hopefully drive home in a little bit. So anyway, that's the, the very, very brief overview. Let me talk a little bit about how the course is, is uh, <coughs> orchestrated. Because we're in Shenzhen, we'll be a slightly accelerated compared to the Georgia Tech Atlanta campus. We'll be doing everything in about 12 weeks, 13 if you count Chinese New Year. Um, which we'll be taking a week-long break from here now, too. I'll, I'll give you a better schedule as we go on. But for this particular class, my name is Professor Durgan. I'm, of course, always available. Um, I'm going to be here mostly from Monday through Thursday uh, during the day. When I'm not teaching, you're welcome to come by my office if I have the door open. I have an open door policy, just come on and, and ask. I won't have any official office hours just because I think our group is in small enough and informal enough where we, we can do that. Uh, but please feel free to come by anytime. The door is open. Um, for the distance learning students, because of 
communications and everything, email is probably going to be the best and possibly only way to get a hold of me unless there's something important to talk about. Um, but that's not usually a problem. Um, The way I'll try to organize the lectures here is the first 45 minutes I'll talk and then we'll take an intermission of about 15 minutes. You can get up, go around, and grab a cup of coffee, walk around, clear your head. I'll probably get a drink of water. And uh, then we'll come back and do another 45 minutes since we have about a 90 minute class period uh, worth of material for two days a week here. Um, that means that We'll take our first break today in about 20 more minutes. Okay. Now, grading for this class. Um, here's the assignment listing that I have. We're going to do homeworks. And I anticipate maybe four to five assignments. worth about 20% of your grade. I will have two midterms, midterm quizzes, and one will be about halfway through the semester, one will be at the end. Um, and collectively they will be worth 40% of the grade. And then instead of a final exam, there's a final project. And that's going to be 40% of your grade as well. Kind of a term paper. And I'll make that assignment probably halfway through the term. Now, what do we cover in this class? That's the interesting part. Here's the topical list that I, uh, it, this will be on your syllabus as well, but we're going to talk about a lot of different things. We're going to first start talking about antennas and their use in energy harvesting. We're going to review a little radiation theory so we can figure out how much power can we get from point A to point B, which is a very important piece of information <coughs> when you're planning these systems in both terms of power and information. Then we're going to talk a little bit about propagation theory. How do we design a wireless uh, system in a realistic environment? Um, we'll talk in depth about RF energy harvesting, the type of electronics and techniques you can use to maximize efficiency. We are then going to switch and do some communication theory. We'll maybe do some case studies talk about uh, UHF RFID tags, how do they work, what kind of communication scheme do they use, how do you do extremely low powered communications wirelessly. It turns out that's a really interesting problem because if you're a really well seasoned RF engineer sending power from one A, point A to point B to get information from point A to point B is not the best way to do that. It turns out that you can actually exchange information using orders of magnitude less power than a Bluetooth or any of these low energy schemes by using things like modulated backscatter where all you really do is just wiggle an electrical load on an antenna and reflect information because the antenna <coughs> antenna is a hunk of metal right so it has a radar cross section a wave shines on it it reflects with the power a certain size of power, certain amplitude and phase. You can change that amplitude and phase by electrically connecting different things to the antenna. That means that gives you the ability to wiggle information back to a reader, for example, that's supplying the power without actually having any RF electronics on the board. And that's the stuff that takes off of power in a device like a sensor or a tag of some sort. So we'll study, uh, we'll do a section on modulated backscatter, talk about how you read that, what does that look like electronically, how do we model that in a communications link. Uh, we'll also start to talk a little about inductive systems. We don't cover that much um, 
in classes anymore, but uh, there's actually quite a bit of elegance into inductively transferring information and power. There are RFID systems that work like that, sensor systems. There are even some wireless power startups in the US right now that are looking to use magnetic induction and certain other forms of magnetic induction involving something called overcoupling to enhance the range and the amount of power transfer that you can do. The idea is that you slap something on a wall and all of a sudden everything in your room is powered. You can even turn on lights and I mean, not run the air conditioning, but at least, you know, do things that traditionally took a lot more power than what people thought could be done wirelessly. So we'll study those systems as well. <coughs> and uh, at the end, maybe we'll do some real fun stuff like talk about something like space solar power or um, some other alternative energy schemes, kind of macro power level. Um, so this could be an interesting class. It'll be fun and we'll study a variety of topics. There's probably something for everybody here. Okay. Now, of course the honor code applies. Um, the class assignments that you hand in, I give everybody at least a week to hand in something. So I'm not gonna assign an, uh, an assignment today. Uh, probably by the end of the week I'll s assign something and then it'll you'll be able to turn it in the following week. But I try to give at least seven days notice so you, know, you have plenty of time to work on it. Um, and for the distance learning students, the day that the Shenzhen students have to hand in the assignment, they have an extra week window since they're on tape delay and they're watching this class. So not that you know who those people are, but. I expect all the honor code to be upheld. Don't be sharing information, publicly posting things on the uh, the internet, and especially since you know there are other people that are working on those assignments that may not have turned it in yet. That goes without saying, but I have thought to say it by according to Georgia Tech. Okay, now let me go ahead. And first ask, do you have any questions about the course and the administration of the course? Ah, yes. Ah, the reference book. We don't have an official text, which is good because that means you don't have to spend $100 on it. I'll be using T-Square uh, almost exclusively to post my own personal notes and then research papers that cover the topics that you, we want in this class. There is no, uh, there, there really isn't a good text to cover this material. Um, it hasn't been written yet because the topic is too new. But collectively I've got enough for you to read that'll keep you busy and informed the entire class period. I'll just make a point to, at the beginning of class, I'll tell you what I post on T-Square that I expect you to read or at least consider if, if you need supplemental materials. So that's how the, the, the textbook, so to speak, will be disseminated. So it's free, right? That's the good news. The bad news is that some of them are IEEE papers. So, oh, gosh. I have to read an IEEE paper. I'll try to pick the good ones. I can't stand a poorly written IEEE paper. I edit for the tra IEEE transactions on wireless communications. I'm an area editor there. They got, you know, they've got like seven, six or seven areas or eight areas. I forget what it is up to now. Each area has about a dozen associate editors under them. So I have this staff of 12 editors that I work with. I just, you know, you're gonna read dozens of manuscripts and not come across a decent one that you're excited about you know, for a long time, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of exhausting. So I, believe me, I, I will vet those papers very carefully before I assign them. Ah, you yeah, have Vanessa? Um, so you said the final product is a term paper? Uh, That's right, it'll be a term paper. The last time I did this class in Shenzhen, um, the only other time I've done this class. This is a special Shenzhen only for the, the distance learning students. You're getting a, a special deal. 
very few people get to take this class get the opportunity to it it's only given to elite students in our shenzhen campus so uh last time i ran this the the distance learning students had to do individualized projects just because they're scattered around the united states usually and this the students here i put them in teams and pairs and they worked on a couple different projects uh in pairs in fact in that year i, I actually had them prepare a paper as if they were submitting it to the IEEE RFID conference that's held annually in North America. If I'm feeling ambitious, maybe we'll do something similar to that, to that, where you prepare it as if it was an IEEE paper. And if I think it's good enough, we'll go ahead and send it. Maybe we can get, to, get you guys to go present at whatever conference we pick out. Um, so is it like a, um, like a review of the technologies, or like is it so it will probably be a little bit more than a review where maybe you have to do a little bit of experimentation, not an undue amount because we've only got 12 weeks here, right? So you know, I'm not going to have you invent anything, but I've got a set of topics that I'm crafting which you can basically select from where you can um, you know, do some simulations of a communication system, for example, or some uh, simulation of a circuit and get a meaningful output and you know publish a, actually have a research worthy publishable topic one you know at least get a conference paper out of it so that's kind of the scope that I see this could be a lot of work for 12 weeks or six weeks because I'm only going to get assign it probably about halfway through you're not going to be able to do it until you have at least a half a dozen like weeks of lecture under your belt Yeah, I expect you to have some ability to do computer usage. I don't really care about the package that you, you use. So I personally like MATLAB. I think most students have access to that somehow or another through the Georgia Tech site. But if you've got another, if you can do everything in, you know, Macintosh numbers, all your computation, that's a perfectly fine platform. If you do it in Mathematica, if you've got some access to, uh, um, another type of software package. For example, be, we're going to do a little bit of antennas and propagation early in the, in the term. And maybe I'll throw in as a couple of topics a few antennas projects that you could do that would be illuminating, pardon the pun, uh, and lead to a really good paper topic where maybe you could actually use some of the tools that Georgia Tech has a free license to. For example, Georgia Tech has a free license for uh, HFS and uh, this thing called CST Microwave Design Studio, where these are normally $20,000 a year licenses that you have to pay for an in industry per, per seat, per engineer that uses them. Uh, but you get it for free as a student. And so maybe you run some simulations on that. That also give you the opportunity to learn those tools if that would help you. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll add a couple topics in the antennas world. Some of you applied physicists might might appreciate that. I don't know. Um, yeah? I thought, I thought HFS was a um, limited um, access. So, so I've never had that problem from my recollection, I, we, we quote use HFS sometimes in the antennas class at Georgia Tech. And I, I am not aware of any recent seat issues with that. There should be plenty. Uh, now, they're, they're going to make you log in remotely from Shenzhen, and maybe there are some issues with that. If you do have an issue with that, let me know. And you, there's a tool that you want. Maybe sometimes if a student asks, the OIT people kind of get around to doing it but if a student and professor both p pester they're like okay okay we'll go ahead and take care of this issue um, so I'm not saying it's not an issue let me know if it is if you want to do something that some administrator is keeping you from doing let me help that's that's what I'm here for to complain okay any other questions about the course Okay, let me go ahead 
i just have a few introductory slides to kind of motivate what we're going to talk about here f8 that's right this is a hmm? oh f5 there we go good thank you it's been a long time since i've used a pc Perfect. Okay. It was just my introduction here. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of graphs. Uh, this is one that appeared years ago in a, um, IEEE Spectrum article. He needs to go out and update it again. It's by a, a researcher n named Kumi from Stanford who was plotting computational trends in computing in general. And of course, everybody is familiar with Moore's Law, right? This was this thing that carried us up until recent years through the progress of semiconductor development where you know the machines were getting twice as fast every 18 months or something like that, every two years, doubling in speed. And the interesting thing about that was that it was, you know, I think Gordon Moore, the, one of the founders of Intel, um, predicted that, I think, all the way back in the 70s or 80s, and it kind of became known as Moore's Law. He said, he said there was no, uh, no visible end to that in the near future. Well, it turns out it did kind of end. But what's really interesting about that is that when Kumi goes back and takes all of the data points he's got here, starting all the way back from the 1940s, so keep in mind that the computers down here, you got the ENIAC, you know, the granddaddy of all computers. So these are made out of relays these are, and vacuum tubes. This is, this is uh, there's no transistor logic in this era. And then all of a sudden, in the late 50s, you start getting transistor-based computation, and the computers here start to get kind of faster, but more importantly, lower power. So you see the horizontal axis here goes from 1940s up into 2010, and the vertical axis is logarithmic. It starts all the way down here at 10 to the uh, minus, let's see, 10 to the minus 2. Yes, yes. And it goes all the way up to 10 to the minus 16 is the top point right here. And that's a logarithmic scale. And this u the axis here is operations per joule. How many joules of energy does it take to do an operation? Now, how you define operation is a little bit, can be a little bit subjective. But with the metric that he plotted in his 2010 article, he showed that all the computers kind of fit along this crazy linear path or, or uh, semi-log y type path where you get exponential increases in computational efficiency as measured in operations per joule. And it doesn't matter which era that you, you cross, whether you're in this microprocessor era here, and you're talking about all these different personal computers and current laptops are all the way at the top here, or you're going through the transistor era where you're using integrated circuits, but not every, everything is individualized transistors, not in a single IC. And here's a nice little curve fit I find for the operations per joule. If you just sort of take this, the year minus 130, raise 14 to the 9 power, you can actually predict. This have, it gives you a little bit of a predictive tool on the energy efficiency of computation. The point that Kumi made in his article is that this trend actually, even though we, he hadn't gotten there in 2010, there was enough innovation in the pipeline to continue this for at least 10 more years. Right, and and that's been observably true. In at least another five to ten more years, uh, we could expect this type of exponential trend. Now, when I plot this plot, here's my version of the plot, which unfortunately uh, has these issues with some versions of PowerPoint. These should be negative signs here, and it looks like I'm I'm presenting to a Greek audience, right? But actually, this is the uh, uh, you know vacuum tube era. This is the transistor era. This is the IAC era. Acro across here, I have an additional era that I kind of define as the multi-core. Because remember, 
This is sort of the classic region that you think of as Moore's Law, where devices are shrinking down in size, and so you can drive them faster and faster and faster. And of course, everybody knows the story. At some point, when you shrink a device, the energy consumption of that device lowers, right? You need less voltage <coughs> and less energy to drive the device. Unfortunately, the volume shrinks faster than the energy, and so you run into a heat dissipation issue very quickly. And that's why your laptops stop and your computers stop, uh, you know, the, the maximum frequency hit about two or three gigahertz a few years ago, and you don't find stuff clocking that much faster than that, maybe four gigahertz. There's a, there's a heat dissipa dissipation issue that's related to the speed. And over here, I flipped the axis here. I, I like to do, do joules per computation. <coughs> and, and to give, put this into perspective, if we go to 10 to the minus 5 here and go away over to here, what is 10 to the minus 5 joules? It's a unit of energy, but when, when we get to those really lo small amounts of joules, it's, it's hard to even envision how much power that is. So here's, here's an analogy. 10 to the minus 5 joules is about the power that it takes for a small insect, like an ant, to climb up from the ground to your kitchen, cab kitchen countertop, about a meter. A rough order of magnitude. That's how much energy it takes. And back in 1989, that would have bought you about one computational operation. If you could slap a generator onto an ant's back harvest his energy as he would, thinks he's climbing up to uh, one meter of height, you could do a computation. Now, fast forward to 2016, how much does that give you here? Let's see, 2016 is right here. That is now uh, 10 to the fifth, 100,000 times more efficient. And we've gotten a lot of those gains, not just by shrinking the device in this region, but also working on architectural gains, using multiple cores that calculate simultaneously and other forms of, of, uh, of power reduction. And so the moral of the story is this trend, interestingly enough, continues through time, and it tends to be technology independent. We get the gains in different ways, but we always seem to get the gains because there's always this next generation of technology that demands lower power uh, in terms of joules per computational operation. So that's the computing side. This is one of the reasons why there is at least a little bit of substance between, you know, behind all of this hype that you hear about for the Internet of Things, that there really is this idea that our, our electronics are now taking so little power to operate that we can now do some really interesting things and put small devices on things that we wouldn't necessarily consider have being able to have done 10 years ago or even five years ago. Now, I'm going to show you another graph um, from the RFID world where I, I'm active in. And this is that comes from a paper of a good friend of mine named Pavel Nikitin. He uh, works for Honeywell, an engineer who's written some of the best background papers in RFID. I'll probably have you read one or two during the semester at some point. Um, here he's got chip power sensitivity. And what we call chip power sensitivity in the RFID world is how much power do you need to turn a device on? How much power? So this is measured in the DBM scale. If you're not familiar with the DBM scale at the start of this class, you will be having dreams in the DBM scale by the end of the class. Maybe nightmares. I don't know. But DBMs is basically 10 log base 10, the power in milliwatts. And it's a very common metric, especially in RF engineering, when you're dealing with low power levels that span a very disparate range of power. Like, for example, <coughs> my laptop 
when it communicates to a wireless router. It's probably transmitting <clears throat> 500 milliwatts of power out of its antenna, just say as a ballpark. Um, that would be 27 dBm. Okay, reasonable. So 10, 10 log 10 of 500 milliwatts is, is that. Now, your cell phone, in order to get an audible signal, uh, this depends on your protocol and also kind of where you are in the city and all, but you can easily get detect a signal at neg 90 dBm in most instances where the interference is not bad. Well, what is that in the linear scale? So that's 10 to the minus 9 milliwatts or 10 to the minus 12 watts. So let's see, milli, micro, nano, pico, a picowatt. You can easily do communications with less than a picowatt, sometimes much less if you've got some signal processing to work with, which we'll talk about. And so now you see why the dBm scale is really important, right? Because we're often talking about these quantities in the same breath. And what we are most interested in, especially we get, when we get into RF engineering and antennas and propagation, is the order of magnitude. Because that's going to tell us whether something is possible or impossible. Whether I can design a link for what I'm thinking about with the power consumption I'm expecting, or whether it's just not possible at all. So anyway, what the, that's the horizontal scale on this plot. And then over here, we have tag range and feet. And I'll put these slides on the T-Square the site tonight <coughs> so that you have access to them. So don't feel like you have to copy your exact graph down. Uh, this, he shows every year what uh, RFID chip makers were able to um, achieve with their latest and greatest RFID chips. Here you start out in 1997, negative 8 dBm. Sensitivity in the RFID community is the amount of power to turn the device on, activate the energy harvesting to the point where it can drive the chip. So there's a lot that goes into that. We'll talk about that later. But it's unfortunate because in the communications world, when you say the word sensitivity in English, you're usually talking about the minimum power to do detectable communications. That's not what they're talking about here. They're talking about how to just power up a chip. So <clears throat> this is, and then over here, you have sort of the ideal free space range that that corresponds to. And my apologies, for some reason he put this in feet. Why did he do that? Well, because he was given the presentation in America. It wasn't one of, the, was one of these international conferences. He should have been in meters, right? I expect every one of you to do things in meters, right? I don't have to tell this crowd that. Um, and then what year did you change the achievement? So I actually have recast this again, what I call Nicotine's plot because I shamelessly copied all of his uh, figures or data points and then added a couple at the end as well. So here I've got almost the exact same data except I've recast the plot so that we have 1995 through 2020 and this nice linear trend, which not surprisingly seems to work no matter where the innovation comes from. We seem to be getting this jump in power efficiency and, and sensitivity for powering up RF chips. So here's the sensitivity in milliwatts going from 10 to the minus 3 up to close to 10. So one milliwatt somewhere up here, one microwatt somewhere up here, and a logarithmic axis. Here's the trend line. And then here are a bunch of data points. And the corresponding range in meters this time. My goodness, I had to change it over to meters to make this useful. But uh, we see we get 5 meters up here, 26 meters down here in 2013. <clears throat> now, interesting, there's been a little bit of lull. It's 2016. We haven't actually broken this sensitivity limit. This sensitivity goes down to about negative 22 dBm. So in other words, we've actually got chips that power up with less than 
10 microwatts of RF power going into the chip. So you can slap an antenna on that, and if you line up the polarization and you don't have obstructions in the way, you can get 26 meters of free space range and still power it up without batteries. Now, well, one of the things that we're going to look, look at in this class is to show that there's actually enough innovation in the pipeline to go for the next 10 years, somewhere down here, where you can now do passively maybe 100 meters, 200 meters. And the, keep in mind, this is obeying the FCC's unlicensed transmission laws. I'm not transmitting 100 watts of power, irradiating a room with a lot of power. I'm transmitting the one watt maximum that I'm allowed to by the United States Federal Communications Commission. Every country has a regulatory body. Um, I don't know, is China's called the CCC? I forget the acronym for the, the Chinese regulatory agency that controls spectral licenses. Does anybody remember from, no? We'll look it up. Okay. So that means that even with these low power transmissions, you could power up something from 100 meters away, or maybe only 10 or 20 meters away, but through walls, like cover a building or at least a home, power it up, retrieve sensor information, do computation. There's a whole vast array of tricks for doing this and some emerging techniques uh, that will enable this kind of bizarre future where you can have uh, chips and circuits everywhere that do energy harvesting and communications and sensing. So we're not that far off and we'll talk about the innovations that exist in this region that will allow you to do that. So by now, I have way overstayed my first uh, discard, my break. So I'm going to make a, first of all, let me ask, do you have any questions about that first part of the presentation before we break for an intermission? Yes? Ah, UHF, ultra high frequency. Yeah, yeah. So these are frequencies between, oh. My annotation, uh, where did that go? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Then above UHF is microwave that's from 3 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. Above 30 gigahertz, the wavelength drops believe, below one centimeter, so we call it millimeter waves. In VHF is very high frequency. That's underneath UHF. That's 30 to 300 megahertz. And these all these are all roughly these markations, demarcations for how we talk about frequency bands are all based on the wavelength of the radiation in free space. So UHF UHF is 300 meters. Uh, excuse me, 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. That conveniently corresponds to one meter to 10 centimeters in terms of wavelength. We'll talk a little bit more about that because when you get into microwave band and higher bands, there are all these crazy designations for how to talk about the band allocation. Some RF engineer will probably come up to you and say, yeah, I've been working a lot at C band. What is C band? Well, if, if you're like a, an RF engineer, uh, you, you know, you'll have the whole band memorized. But if you're like, uh, I, I recommend just saying, instead of saying C band, just say the frequency that you're operating at. 5.5 gigahertz. If you're doing work in 5.5 gigahertz, say 5.5 gigahertz. Don't say C band. Right? This is one of the instances where engineers have made their profession look more like the legal profession by shrouding their practice in obscure jargon that keeps the outsiders out, you know? I'm not a very big advocate of that. So I won't be using this, but we'll probably review, you know, when somebody says S-band, what are they talking, when somebody says L-band, what are they talking about? Okay, that's a good question. question. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, 
Uh, the, the meters here is the separation distance between a transmitter and a receiver. So in this, in this scenario, in this graph, we have a, uh, it's kind of reversed, transmitter, receiver, I'm transmitting one watt maximum out here. I have free space link. How far can I separate these two and still get this, this separation distance? So of course, as the sensitivity drops, my range should increase accordingly. Okay, any other questions before we break? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <coughs> yeah, in fact, we'll, we'll do a little unit on near field communications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My question is uh, so, uh, how long is the uh, commercial uh, using I mean, the distance? Oh, yeah. So, so, near field communications is intrinsically short range, and it's designed to be that way because it's used for protected types of applications, right? Mm -hmm. That's right, that's right. You intentionally want a, a link that degrades very quickly. And we'll do an analysis to figure out, you know, how predict what is the power level that you get as you take two inductive coils and move them apart. And, you know, how, how, how tight of a bubble of communications can you place around that link? So it depends on the application. If you want something that requires long range, you have to do something far field, which is, one set of topics that we study in this class. If you intentionally want something that restricts the range, you're making a payment with the terminal and you don't want people to hear it. Now it turns out in this class, we'll discuss ways that you can sabotage that and you can go real, read those near field payments from a long distance away. But, but shh, I could get in trouble for teaching some of this stuff, right? I could send the, the world finance industry <laughs> on its ear by sabotaging it. But generally speaking, yeah, those, those inductive and near field forms of communications intentionally bring it down because you don't want people to listen to your payment. Or um, the, F, the Shenzhen tap cards for the subway. You have tap cards for the subway? That's also, a, it's a very similar standard. It's actually based on near field communications was probably based on that ISO standard that that card is using more than likely. I haven't looked at the Shenzhen system specifically, but Generally, that's a 13 megahertz card that's uh, similar to the NFC. And you don't want that to have a lot of range. Otherwise, you know, the turnstile to the right of you reads your card instead of the turnstile in front of you. And that, that causes all sorts of problems at the subway station. So those are examples of that. Lots of, there are lots of applications that, that are like that, where you want short range and nothing more. But in some instances, you want lots of range. You want to be able to go to the building across the street here, maybe. We'll talk about some espionage. Mm -hmm. That would be fun. I think I've got a couple examples of international espionage that I can talk about because they're in textbooks and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, any other questions? Well, well, we'll be back at, let's take a 15 minute break and then, uh, that will be back at 2.30, which means we'll only have about a half an hour class left, but I, I think that'll be fine. Okay. Welcome back after the break. Um, there was one other point that I wanted to make on this presentation. Look at this graph here. This is, again, the uh, year timeline and sensitivity of RFID tags, just to illustrate this idea of uh, devices becoming more energy efficient, uh, fewer computations for Joel, and also a bit wrapped up in this is our ability to harvest RF energy more efficiently too. You'll notice there's some interesting breaks in this diagram. See how, like the trend line, of course, is exponential, looks kind of like this. But you'll notice that there seems to be like a stair-steppy thing going on here, right? Because there really haven't been many 
point since this point we might have shaved like a fraction of a dB off the sensitivity uh, and it's interesting to always look at the history and, and what is actually driving this stuff so what's interesting here is from here to here like what, what is the big thing that happened in this span where there was a sort of a suspension of activity and then a quick big jump like that who was the impetus behind that and the for this particular graph I can sum up the story in one word Walmart do you have Walmart in Shenzhen yeah yeah so in 2003 it was about this time period here Walmart made this proclamation they said <coughs> We are going to modernize our logistics. We're the world's biggest retailer. We gotta sell all, you know, keep track of all this supply chain stuff. And so they said, we are going to make everybody have a UHF RFID tag on every pallet that comes into a Walmart warehouse. And if not, if you don't have an RFID tag on your pallet that can be read readable by our equipment, we're gonna find you a $2 fine for pa per pallet. As it doesn't sound l like much, but that adds up quickly. Uh, you're talking about billions of dollars, potentially. Um, at least hundreds of millions per year for a big company like that. So all of a sudden, there was this enormous investment in RFID that accelerated this down. <coughs> and in the end, I think Walmart eventually ratcheted back on its promise. They said, well, $2 was kind of stiff, and the technology isn't quite doing what we thought it would up front, so maybe we'll just do 10 cent penalty per pallet, which is almost the cost of a tag. <laughs> so and we're down to here. But all through this time, what was leading to this gain in this instance was the fact that the devices were getting smaller more power efficient, you were using lower and lower integration processes. I think some of these early on tags were using 350 nanometer um, scale CMOS for their chips or higher, some high level, maybe even 500, um, excuse me, yeah, yeah, 500 or maybe even like 1.3 micron. When, when we talk about the scale of integration, we're talking about the size of the transistor that's being used to integrate the logic. And when you talk about CMOS transistors, it's common to refer to them in terms of their gate size, the channel width for their gate. And so when I say this is a 180 nanometer process, that means that the width of the gate of the transistor are 100 nanometers. For those of you that haven't had like a devices course, we're, we're not gonna turn you into device physics physicists in this course, but we'll give you at least a background so you can talk to them and know what they're talking about. <coughs> and my apologies, I'm getting over a cold. Um, I think whenever I go to a foreign country and I'm trapped on a plane with all those germs for 24 hours, uh, then that this happens to me. So I'm getting over it, thankfully. Hopefully the next lecture won't be as <coughs> colorful. So anyway, shrinking the device size, getting more efficiency this way. The other thing that we learned how to do at some point here was to incorporate Schottky diodes into the process. As we're going to learn, you, the way that you may get wireless power converted from RF to DC, which is the form that you can use for logic, the way to do that is to use diodes and capacitors in something called a rectifier circuit or charge pump. We'll go over several topologies of circuits for that. But at the end of the day, there, there's a million and one ways to make circuits that convert RF to DC. They always involve capacitors and diodes. And those turn out to be the limiting devices on whether how they work. Uh, and, and we'll get into this in a little bit, but you would like to have diodes that have very low turn on and voltage because you have to turn a volt diode on in order to use it. And that represents an amount of voltage and power investment in the device before it starts operating. So it would be good to have a diode that has a low turn on voltage. <coughs> what is the standard silicon diode turn on voltage that you learn in your undergraduate electronics class? 0.7, right. 
But what they don't tell you, that, at least not in that first class, is usually that the, the forward bias diode voltage is almost completely arbitrary. You can dope it and change it, right? Um, but generally speaking, the lower the better. And it turns on, turns out that Schottky diode, that is silicon, dope silicon on metal junctions, have the lowest turn on voltage that we can usually muster on a circuit. There are ways to actually get the turn on voltage lower, but it turns, on, turns out that the lower you make the turn on voltage, what else has to happen to the VI characteristic of a diode? Do you remember from your undergraduate class? If you lower turn on voltage, you have to increase reverse bias current, leakage current, basically. The set, the, so, so that it's easier to get charges across a low voltage barrier, but it's harder to keep them there once you've done it. And that's sort of a trade-off. That actually is, a, there's a fundamental limit that keeps diodes from behaving like really good rectifiers because of that. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the class too. But just to give you a little bit of foreshadowing. So yeah, you have this region where we're improving the diodes, we're, imp we're using less power on the RFID chip, uh, we're using devices that use less power because we're shrinking them down. And then we hit here, and it's interesting, somewhere around 2010, all of a sudden our devices in RFID this gives you a, a benchmark for how far our computing has come. They stopped being power limited and they started to become voltage limited. What does that mean? That means that if you could draw a magic line, the devices on this side of the line, they failed because they needed more power than could be converted at that point. So for example, if I had uh, 10 to the minus 2, well, let's say 10 to the minus 1. 10, uh, 100 microwatts of power. The device failed here because I needed 5 microwatts of power to drive the device. And I had conversion circuits that maybe only worked at 50% efficiency. And so once I dropped below 10, 100 microwatts, I'm not getting the right power level out. Over here on this side of the grass, we, we call these devices voltage limited. <coughs> because the computation and the logic on this side of the device is no longer limited by the power, it's limited by the output voltage. So as we're going to see, it's actually very difficult to get a high voltage once your power level drops below a certain threshold. And so if we have 10 to the minus 2, 10 microwatts of power over here, we might be able to convert 50% of that power and get 5 microwatts out. And it turns out that our devices might only use 1 or 2 microwatts of power. They're very energy efficient but we still can't drive them because we don't have enough voltage to get the transistors to behave in a nonlinear fashion. You need at least one or two volts of, of, of uh, voltage to put across the gate of a transistor in order to make it look like a good switch. Now there's this whole realm of, of devices called sub-threshold logic that we, we can talk about uh, later in the class where you can try to get away with less than one or two volts. But this is what's limiting devices nowadays. So this, this behavior here, this trend line, just like the compute computational limit trend line, belies a great deal of behavior. Uh, there's a lot more going on than would just be a, apparent from these little dots that I'm playing connect the dots with. So I think it's kind of interesting to go back and look at the story behind some of these graphs and see how they've changed with time and you know what are the things. We've pretty much actually l reached this plateau for what we can do with Schottky diodes. Was there other things that we can use? As remember, back over here, you said we introduced Schottky diodes. The thing about CMOS is that we use CMOS because not only is it very low power, but it's very cheap to make relative to other technologies. 
We've been working for, with silicon for 60 years now. We understand the substrate and how to make a field effect transistor on it incredibly well. If you switch media and try something different, that's, there's going to be a cost increase. But there's also more potential. And likewise, one of the things that makes silicon cheap in mass production is that you take a design for a circuit, and then you do a layout. And if you follow a standard set of rules for the cheapest CMOS processes, then you can go to a foundry and they say, make this chip. Put, a, put 100,000 of them on a wafer, and they'll do it for you. And it costs, once they set up the wafer, there's like a setup fee, but once they set it up, it's like 1000 or $2,000 a wafer, which when you divide it by 100,000 devices, you know, that's very cheap. Um, and that's how you make the, the pennies per component electronic devices. But in order to make that process work, you have to have this standard handoff between the circuit designers and the foundries. So there's these, this set of rules that says, OK, if you want to make this kind of device, a CMOS transistor, P-type transistor, field effect transistor, here's what it, the dimensions look like. Here's the doping profile. If you want to make an NFET, here's what the do device looks like. Here's the doping profile. If you want to make a resistor, here are the different sizes. Here's how to link them. And so it's a very rigid process. And you need that rigidity to make it reproducible with a high reliability cheaply at one of these foundries. So it wasn't until this part where Schottky diodes were even kind of part of that recipe, even though the Schottky diode had been around for decades, the cheapest CMOS processes, there was never really any use for having one up until these RFID guys came around, started demanding Schottky diodes. That's something that you don't necessarily need a Schottky diode to implement the logic. Logic yeah, for a microprocessor, design an entire microprocessor without a Schottky diode. <clears throat> and so, you know, what are the things that are going to, can you do things besides Schottky diodes to get further? Well, as we'll learn in this class, there are things called tunnel diodes, metal insulation, metal spin diodes, all these, these exotic devices. We'll even look at a little thermoelectric devices. And there's a lot of promising technology that projects down into this region, as well as techniques. Okay. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Lows. <coughs> and hmm, there we go. So any any more questions before we continue on? Okay. So um, I think you brought it up in class. I think this would probably be a really good time for me to just review what are the different bands uh, formally that we're going to be talking about. This will basically allow our discussion a lot more fluidly. So I can say things like the uh, HF band, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, or the, the millimeter wave band. And so just to have this in your notes, let's go ahead and actually define these. UHF? <coughs> is ultra high frequency. This is 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. So the UHF RFID free, um, application that I were talking about, all those tags for inventory logistics were at 915 megahertz, kind of in the middle of this band. And as I said, everything in electromagnetics and RF engineering ultimately is reference to the free space wavelength. How do you calculate the free space wavelength for a wave? You take its wavelength in meters times the frequency in hertz. And for a traveling wave, that should be the velocity of propagation in meters per second. Now, in free space for radio waves, that is, of course, C, the speed of light in vacuum. Even if it's in air, I mean, a wave traveling in air is essentially in vacuum, right? The speed of light in vacuum is about 3.0 times 10 to the meet, uh, 8 meters per second. 
and that number does not change uh, when you move into air in, as opposed to a vacuum until you get to like the fourth or the fifth significant digit. Yeah, so we <laughs> we are, as an RF engineer, you know, there's an old saying in English that says, almost doesn't count unless it's horseshoes and hand grenades, right? But here in RF engineering, we use the dB scale for a reason, because we're just trying to get order of magnitude close, right? So really the uh, expression is almost doesn't count unless you're in horseshoes, hand grenades, and RF engineering. So lambda is equal to one meter for 300 megahertz and 10 centimeters for three gigahertz. If you pl solve in this equation, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, F is 300 me megahertz or three gigahertz. Then beneath that is the VHF band, it's what early broadcast television used. This is 30 megahertz to 300 megahertz. This would be 10 meters. This would be one meter. There's HF, three megahertz to 30 megahertz. This is, of course, 100 meter wavelength and 10 meters and so forth. Beno beneath HF, you have medium frequencies, which is MF. And then you have low frequencies be be below that. Then you have very low frequencies and ultra low frequencies. And, and we don't really care too much about stuff down here. There are maybe some applications that work at about 125 kilohertz that involve inductive transfer of power and sensing. We may mention a few of them, but most of the action for us is going to be in these bands there above. Above 3 gigahertz is what we call microwave. So that would be from 10 centimeters to 1 centimeter. And then above that, 30 gigahertz, which corresponds to 1 centimeter, because millimeter wave, because essentially you go from measuring the wavelength in terms of centimeters to millimeters. Basically, from 1 to 10 millimeters is the wavelength of a millimeter wave. Makes perfect sense, right? And then much farther above that, you get into something called the terahertz band, because you're now talking about frequencies that are on the order of 10 to the 12th, right? Yeah. And above through, terahertz can sometimes, even though it's terahertz, they sometimes refer to anything above 300 gigahertz as terahertz. Like the, the journals and the conferences on terahertz will often include that frequency band because it's kind of close enough to that really high frequency to count. Likewise, you'll find there's also some slop with regards to where the UHF band stops and where does microwave truly begin. Uh, this is the official definition of the UHF band, but anything above one gigahertz sometimes is what people call microwaves. You'll find that the Journal of Microwave Theory and Techniques, in fact, the IEEE Journal, that, that one of the best research publications in the field of microwave engineering, they'll publish stuff down to the HF band, anything that's considered RF, which is this regime right here, is, uh, is lumped into some of these research areas involving microwaves. I tend to be a purist. Three gigahertz and below is UHF. Above three gigahertz is microwave. So I'll, I'll try to be consistent with that terminology, but just recognize that uh, this is sort of how we, we talk about the system and talk about the things that we're studying. Okay. Now, there's one last thing to do to kind of give us some background in antennas and radiation and RF. Is I'm going to put down uh, the solution, the radiation solution for something called the Hertzian dipole.
Don't be scared by the math. I'm not going to derive Maxwell's equations or do anything like that. We don't have time for that in this class. And you all have probably seen something like that in your undergraduate days. So I'm not going to insult you. But the Hertzian dipole turns out to be the simplest possible radiation problem that we know of in physics. It's basically when you take a tiny infinitesimal current in an electromagnetically small dipole. So imagine that you connected this structure here. Let's blow it up a little bit. I like to keep it physically small on the, the board because uh, it is physically small. But let's say you have this system. A time harmonic sinusoidal voltage connected to an antenna that's very small. And when I say very small, I mean very small electromagnetically. The length is only a fraction of a wavelength of radiation. Whatever frequency this is supplying, the free space wavelength of that is much larger than this structure. And we'll call this length delta Z, and I is the magnitude of the sinusoidal current flowing into and out of the, the Hertzian dipole. So if I want to express the electromagnetic fields radiating from the structure, what do they look like? So I'm going to go ahead and put that solution on the board. And the thing is not to trick, not to turn this into an electromagnetics class, which would be a wonderful thing, right? But the, the point is to give you a, an appreciation for, one, how difficult radiation theory and physics is for even the simplest radiating structure, because it's kind of a mess. But also, we'll be able to glean some of the most interesting behaviors of radiating systems just by looking at this one solution. So because of time limitations, I think I'm just going to put the, the uh, electric field distribution on the board. And this is going to, I'm going to do it in phasor form. In this class, whenever I have a phasor, what do we use phasors for? Phasors are complex values that track amplitude and phase. Hmm? Amplitude and That's right, amplitude and phase of time harmonic systems that are linear and time invariant. <clears throat> yeah, we need that, we need that extra dimension of phase angle in all of our calculations. And so if I want to let me erase that. If I want to express my E field as a function of R, theta, and phi. And of course, I'm going to define the origin to be right smack dab in the middle of my Hertzian dipole. And I'm going to move some distance r away from the dipole at some elevation angle theta measured from the z-axis. And of course, I've got azimuth angle in here too. Although, as I would expect, a little antenna like this that's just a little stick in the z-direction should be azimuthally independent, right? There should be no azimuth dependence. So I, I should really get a distance and a phi dependence. If I want to see the electric field that emanates from this structure and measure it in terms of volts per meter, this is the solution that I get. It's equal to J, a quantity called eta. It is equal to the square root of the permeability over the permittivity of the medium. In free space, that's 377 ohms. Interestingly, it has units of ohms. So the transport impedance of a medium. It tells you the ratio of E and H that an electromagnetic wave will transport in a medium. So J, eta, I, delta Z, 2 pi, over wavelength squared. So we have magnitude of the current, sinusoidal current going in, the length of the dipole, delta Z, Lambda squared, the wavelength, 2 pi, everybody knows what that is. There's an angular dependence, cosine the theta, the angle of elevation. As I move down in theta, I get a more and more E field until I get along the horizon. 
exp to the minus j 2 pi r over lambda, uh, excuse me, yeah, over lambda times r hat times the quantity 0 plus j 2 pi r over lambda squared plus 1 over 2 pi r over lambda cubed. Okay, so that's the first term. That's the R component. Remember E field, electric field. If you measure it at a point of observation, R, theta, and phi, it is itself a vector quantity. It points in a certain direction. So this is the R hat component. This is the component that points in the R hat direction, away from the antenna. Now it turns out there is also a theta hat component. Theta hat is a unit vector that points in this direction. In this class, I don't anticipate unit using unit vectors very much, but if I do, it will have a little hat on it. And let's see if I can scroll down here, if I can get some more space. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. So then, that's not the only term. There's this minus j pi eta i delta z over lambda squared sine theta exp to the minus j 2 pi r over lambda. This time there's a theta hat. And you multiply that by one, minus 1 over 2 pi r lambda plus j 2 pi r over lambda squared plus 1 2 pi r over lambda quantity cubed. Uh, we have a 2 pi with this sine theta term. Uh, let's see. Where, where do we have this? This, this would be sine theta term. This sine one? J pi sine theta? Pi cos theta. Uh, 2 pi cos theta. There's a pi over here. Yeah, and the two, there should not be a two there, just for, so, so <coughs> I, I put this on here not to scare you because I, I actually do derive this. I think I do this in undergraduate uh, antenna engineering. Do you remember this, Vanessa? Did we actually derive the radiation theory equations and work through the solution of the Hertzian dipole? It probably took like two solid weeks. But if you're in an antenna engineering, you gotta develop an appreciation for the discipline. So I force all of my students to do that. Here, we're not going to bother with that. I just put this up here to show you, hey, you need to respect engineers that do electromagnetics for a living, right? It's hard work. The other thing to say is, is this is actually very complicated. The, the, the physics of what's going on in a radiation system, radiating system, even around the simplest possible system, is complicated. This is why we need $20,000 a year tools to solve these systems for us. However, there's really important information to be gleaned uh, from, from all this. Um, and that is, if I look at this, I've broken this nasty expression into an interesting series, right? I have basically one over r to the one term is my first one. And of course, there's no term up here. There's a zero here. There's a minus one over something that depends on r to the one. And then I have one over r to the two terms here and here, one over r to the three terms here and here. And the scales, not just r to the third, but r over lambda to the third. So when 2 pi r is bigger than lambda, or some people will just use the rule of thumb, r bigger than lambda, r greater than a wavelength. What happens to most of these terms? They disappear. They disappear. They become insignificant. There's only one that's going to dominate, 1 over r, this term all the way down here. 
And when a, when a radiating system is behaving like that, we call that the far field. So when we go for range, when we go for high long range, this is the term that we're going to focus on. We're going to do link budget analysis and, and talk about how much power you get from point A to point B to do my energy harvesting scheme. We're going to use far field. When we're talking about NFC payments or inductive power transfer or something where you've got a coil at low frequencies, these terms are actually the ones that dominate, right? There are as smaller than lambda. R over lambda is a small number. I raise it to the third power. I'm making it bigger when it's in the denominator. And I can neglect the other part of this. <coughs> and so this is another reason why I put this solution up here. Because at the end of the day, every system, no matter how complicated it is, can be viewed as the superposition of a tiny, bunch of tiny little Hertzian dipoles. You, if you have a big electromagnetically large loop, you can treat it as a bunch of tiny little Hertzian dipoles, you know, around in a circle. If you have a sheet of metal that's acting as an antenna, you just populate it with a bunch of differently amplituded and phased Hertzian dipoles, and you use superposition to calculate the answer. But we're really just superimposing this complicated result here. So, however this tiny little Hertzian dipole behaves is how any antenna or radiating system or loop or inductive system will actually behave. And this will govern whether we're talking about the near field or the far field. So I'll, I'll end the lecture on that um, and then we'll break for uh, Wednesday. Wednesday we'll talk about antennas and circuits and maybe we'll work through some examples of uh, how to harvest power with antennas. It'll be useful for people that do something in wireless communications, but also be feed into our discussion of charge pumps and RF energy harvesting. And I'll also put my slides, some introductory notes in a separate file, and then maybe also a paper reading assignment for you um, on the T-Square site by tonight, pos possibly tomorrow morning. So look for that. Any questions before we break? No? Okay. See you Wednesday.